This should be interesting. It's a $3 mains powered emergency light from AliExpress. And this is one of these things that you can add various picks to your order on AliExpress and there's no extra postage charge. It just gets shipped. And as I say, this costs $3. Uh, it's got the plug tucked in the back here. It's got these little things that flip out the side uh, so you can screw it onto a wall. Comes with screws. Also has these little hooks for hooking it onto a wall. Um, let's plug it in. Oh, there's also a free bit of plastic. I'm not really sure what that's off. We'll find out when we open it. It has a test button, a energy, a green LED, and then it's got the maximum intensity setting and the lower setting. So high, off, low, and it just comes on straight away. Let's plug it into the tester here and see what it shows. So I will turn it on for this to see if it does turn off properly. So we plug it in, it does turn itself off, the green LED is lit, there's a little test button here that does make it light up, this is good. And the power readings are 0.6 watts, and that's not much, 53 milliamps and absolutely abysmal power factor of 0 0.044, that pretty much tells me that this is a capacitive dropper in here. Quite a lot of current though, 53 milliamp, that's quite a decent capacitor. And then when you unplug it... It comes straight on into emergency mode. Excellent. Let's put this out of the way and open it. So where is my spudger? There's my spudger. Tucked away here. I Sesamo. I like the fact that you can coil this cable up and put it in. And it's got a little outlet here that you can basically just, well, I presume, screw it to wall above a light fit, a socket or something like that. See how easy this is to open. I see clip positions here. Let's aim for one of those. And we'll see if that's going to come out now. Yes, it is. Cover comes off. That's nice. They've got the little plastic reflector of it. The circuit board has quite a bit of circuitry on it. Let's zoom down this. Just a little bit. Where's the battery? Oh, it's a double A. Oh, I see. It's got a plastic housing for the double A. Oh, there's where the bit of plastic came off. It came off from the battery housing. And then these contacts must just sit down into that. Really? Let's try that. Oh, there's switches and things here. So I'm going to have to align it up with the holes. Uh, this is probably a terrible idea to try this while the video is playing. While it's recording. And now if I just press, is it going to is it going to line up? Oh, it did. I think it lined up. Yes, it did. Okay. That's interesting. I'm not seeing an inductor on this circuit board immediately, which I would have expected for a, a nickel metal hydride or nickel cadmium cell. See what voltage this is. It's not marked with anything other than just Hongle. Hongle. What voltage is it going to be? Hold on, let me bring that in. 3.81. This is a lithium cell. Ooh, I wonder what it's charging up to. I wonder what it's charge control circuitry is like. Does it have a T? TP4056 LTH7? No, it doesn't. Not obviously. Right, tell you what, I shall take a picture of this, reverse engineer it, and we can explore the circuitry. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. Not bad circuitry. Quite weird circuitry, but not bad. The charging of the lithium cell is inspirational, because it is actually capping it before 4.2 volts. That's impressive. So in the back of the circuit board, we have a big capacitor. We've got an electrolytic capacitor for smoothing. The big one here is for the uh, capacitive dropper. And the universal voltage rating, 110 to 240 volts, to be honest, my temptation would be to reduce the value of this to remove a bit of the strain on the circuitry if you're on 220 to 240 volts. 
There's a little switch that switches between the multiple modes, off and high and low. There's a little test button, and there is the green LED that shows that it is operational and charging. Doesn't guarantee it's charging, but it shows that the, the circuitry is operational. So we start off the capacitor over here uh, with its discharge resistor, and we've got the rectifier here. We've got a Zener diode with a 10 ohm resistor in series with it, clamping that, and uh, the little um, electrolytic capacitor, and also a 1K resistor clamping that. Then the power goes via a 20 ohm resistor, which is kind of important, to feed the rest of the circuitry, and this diode then heads over to the LED control circuitry. And it's interesting to note, and I screwed this up with the first version of reverse engineering. Let's zoom down this a bit. I screwed up slightly because the first version of this I did, I thought all the LEDs were facing the same way around, but they're not. These ones are facing the same way around. These two, these two, but then the other ones are all facing the opposite direction. Must make manufacture a little bit more tricky because the pick and place machine has to, well, be programmed to rotate all the LEDs. They're not going the same polarity as such. But there is a transistor that uh, not only turns the LEDs on, but also uh, uh, regulates the current to them. Just purely, it's amplifying the base current to the specific level to light the LEDs at a specific intensity. Here is the charge circuit. Now, this 1K resistor here is lighting the LED. The charge circuit is uh, basically a resistor, a zener diode, and a transistor, and it's a very simple voltage regulator. Very weird. Uh, after that, we get the push button, which uh, is amusing, the way they've implemented the test button. It shorts the power supply. I did fit this all onto one sheet. I wish I'd split it now a little bit. We can zoom right up in this, and it will be visible. Here's a supply come in, 110 to 240 volt, whatever. Uh, here is a, to be honest, it would work at around about 50 volts AC, just at reducing current. But here is the 680 nanofarad capacitor with its 220k discharge resistor, so you don't get little zaps off the pins. There is the 1K shunt resistor, presumably just to make sure that the voltage across this capacitor drops quickly. Um, but it's quite a surprising value of resistor for that. I'd have chosen perhaps a higher value because uh, it uh, will be shunting a fair amount of current from this, which is clamped to roughly 5.6 volts. But there's a 10 ohm resistor in series. I think that may be to spread some of the dissipation or just nudge the voltage up, fine tune it. Not sure. But that is the power supply, and it goes up via this 20 ohm resistor to the rest of the circuitry. Here's the test button. Let's get that out of the way first, and the indicator. The test button just shorts that supply out, and uh, then that emulates a power failure and the light comes on. This 1K resistor is in series with the uh, green LED, and it just lights whenever there is power there. Here is the voltage regulator for the lithium cell. I mean, this is inspirational. That's it. That's the lithium charger light right there. It has a 330 ohm resistor, a 4.7 volt uh, Zener diode, and a standard NPN transistor. Now, when you've got the NPN transistor configured like this, with its collector actually going straight up to the positive, then the way it works is that as the current flows through it and the voltage rises on this lithium cell, as it gradually, gradually reaches the voltage of the base minus about 0.6 volts, the current will gradually decrease. In this case, this is a 4.7 volt Zener. I actually measured 4.66 volts across it because there is a slight variation around the sweet spot of a Zener. You, you're not just even it. If you used a Zener at, say, 100 microamps and then 100 milliamps, the voltage wouldn't be the dead on 4.7. That's just a rough voltage. It'll vary around that. So theoretically, in that sense, this resistor here could actually fine tune that by veering the current through it to set uh, its voltage. But anyway... I measured 4.17 volts, which if you work it out, the 4.66... Hold on, let's get the calculator. 4.66 volts measured across that, minus the 4.17 that was across the open circuit uh, lithium cell position is 0.49, so it's roughly 0.5 uh, being dropped across that... Uh, base to emitter connection that turns that transistor on. But that is the simplest I've seen. And the fact it was 4.17 dead on was just surprising. It means that the cell isn't going to get overcharged. And also there is the scope to um, 
tweak and tune that to maybe make it charge to a lower level. Maybe even a different Zener if you can find one that kind of fits into that. But the Zener standard voltage values tend to go up in quite significant steps. Anyway, once the cell is charged and there is no over discharge protection, that's worth mentioning because if you leave this circuit board switched on in the event of power cut, it will, by the time it reaches about 2.5 volts, the LEDs are starting to go out. Uh, that's the LEDs there. And the current will rapidly drop to about 1 milliamp. And then as it goes down lower and lower, it'll be about 500 microamps, but it will never go off completely. There'll always be a slight current drain. So it's worth mentioning that, that uh, once it's been, if you are using this as a handheld light, uh, when, once it starts getting too dim, turn it off just to save the lithium cell from over discharge. If it's mounted in the wall and there's nobody there, that's just what happens. It will charge back up again. Um, then there's a P channel, a uh, P, P channel, PNP transistor. And PNP transistors have to be have their base pulled negative to turn them on. So it's normally pulled up high with this 27K resistor. And then there's a diode going to the switch, which has three positions, off in the middle and then high and low. If you switch it to the high position, the, the current will flow into the base via this 3.9K resistor. But if you switch to low, it's the 3.9K plus the 3K, giving 6.9K. And that uh, the gain of that will then be affected by the load and how much current is flowing into the base. And it, they've just chosen those values to get that intensity. However, when the power is there, it current flows via this diode and pretty much biases this positive, which keeps that uh, transistor turned off. So that's the bit that is actually stopping this from... Um, turning on at any other time it's just only when the voltage across the power supply drops to zero uh, this or near zero this will actually allow it to turn that transistor on and that is it i mean the most interesting about this is the wacky little voltage regulator being used for that transistor do you know the last time i can recall seeing that particular regulator circuit was in the bell intercom the door entry system and it was the little voice module had uh, one of these little voltage regulating devices in it just presumably so they could choose a, a very specific voltage that they set but that is it a uh, very interesting little device surprised it's actually got a lithium cell in it surprised it treats it so well but it works and that is ultimately the main thing and it's a nice design it is single-sided which is quite frankly astounding given the complexity of the circuit down here but they've managed to just interweave the led parallel feed across here without any significant dedicated jumpers just the standard resistors are being used as the jumpers across tracks uh, but that is it so if you do want to tame it down for the charge current and take a lot of strain off the zener diodes then you could change this the value of this capacitor here which is this one from 680 nanofarad you could change it to 330 because the current was fairly high about over 50 milliamps and that would reduce it to about 25 milliamps which means that it would take about a day to recharge this lithium cell up to a sensible level but um, it depends if you were in a sort of high power outage area then maybe you want a higher current for that uh, being charged up quickly again but that's it very interesting circuit. Uh, took a while to reverse engineer, but was worth it because it was just such interesting circuitry.